Good evening to the April 2023 session of the Richmond Art Gallery's Artist Salon Series. Uh, my name is Kathy Tykolis. I am the Richmond Art Gallery's Education and Public Programs Coordinator. And on behalf of the Richmond Art Gallery Association, I would like to welcome you to this program that takes place on the ancestral territories of the Hunkmedem speaking peoples, which are the nations that uh, lived along the Fraser River Delta, including the Musqueam. And so thank you all from wherever you happen to be Zooming in from tonight. Um, and in a few mom moments, I will welcome our guest, Penny Lane Shen, for a full hour of Q&A uh, with our online audience. Uh, so before we begin, I just wanna go through a few housekeeping notes about tonight. Um, first of all, about the salon. Um, for those of you who are new to the Artist Salon, it is a monthly free program. Uh, that's a series of free talks by arts professionals and artists held on the last Wednesday of every month from February to November. Uh, the goal of the program is to offer visual artists a mix of professional development, uh, tips and advice to help strengthen and build up our artist community um, with interactive and in-person events and hosting topics of inspiration for artists to just keep on making your work and to keep growing in your practice. The Artist Salon also exists as a private Facebook group. Um, this provides resources for artists mainly in the Lower Mainland only um, with regular posts for artist calls, professional development opportunities, um, residencies that are happening, local arts events. It's also a place for you to share your art events and to connect with other artists in the Lower Mainland. Um, so you can find out more about the Artist Salon program and our Facebook group um, on our website. Um, and we've also posted it here in the chat for you. So tonight's session is fully interactive um, with an opportunity for all of you to send in questions throughout the presentation. Uh, please note, we do have a very large turnout tonight. Um, so we want to get to as many of your questions as possible. Um, so we are gonna consider tonight a lightning round of Penny Lane Shen gems. <laughs> Um, we won't be able to go into a lot of detail with most of your questions, maybe two to three minutes per answer, um, just so that we can get to everyone's questions in the next hour. Um, that said, if you did want to chat further, we'll include Penny Lane's contact information via the Dazed and Confucius website. Um, we'll include that in the chat as well as um, on our website and on our YouTube channel once the video goes up. Um, in case you wanted to book a longer discussion and consult with her, um, as well if you want to hear about her office hours, which is coming up in the fall. So before we start, I would like to briefly introduce Penny Lane, um, for those who may not know her. Um, I was planning, I'm just going to read some of her bio because I think it's just such a great example of her writing uh, and marketing that she does for artists. So Penny Lane Shen is an artist advisor, curator, and educator. Since 2006, her company, Dazed and Confucius, has offered one-on-one -on -one consultations to over 1,000 artists each year and business development seminars worldwide. While Dazed and Confucius caters to artists' needs, such as marketing and career support, what sets them apart from other art advisories is their core philosophy, prioritizing strong concepts and identity building first and foremost. Penny Lane's interest for her clientele is, simply put, improvement of the work itself. Her strengths are in seeing the weak points in the body of work and recognizing how it could reach a wider audience. This may involve technique, concept, ethos, and commentary. I just think that's such a great example of what Penny Lane does for people. She is able to cut to the core, um, write succinctly for you if you need her to write for you. Um, and she's also great at marketing what artists do. Um, so you can see that's maybe a little bit why I wanted to have her on tonight. <laughs> I have had uh, Penny Lane do various workshops and talks for me at the Richmond Art Gallery in previous years, um, and she's always popular. And I know artists always really appreciate her comments. So I'm so happy to have her back. And I'm so happy you agreed to do this Ask Me Anything session. Um, I, I think it's a great way for us to really get to the core of what people want. Totally. Love it. Uh, I think Kathy, when we're just trying to formulate what you, what we were going to talk about, we're just like, well, why don't we just take questions and then we'll know exactly what we need to talk about. So here we are. Um, and I see there's a couple of questions already in our Q and A. So thanks. Thanks, uh, Camille and Nina for already popping those in there. Um, and I know Kathy, you have a few from that were just sent in ahead of time. So feel mm -hmm. free to continue to pop in your um, questions in the Q and A 
and we'll lightning round them as fast as we can. Yeah. And also don't, you can hit the little thumbs up on the Q and A um, if it's the same question as you have. And that way you'll kind of know what are the more, the more popular ones or the more common questions that might be out there. So should I go right into it? Should I go to the email questions first? I, it's up to you, Kathy. I think take it as you will. I, I love what's going on in this Q and A feature. This mm -hmm. is new, huh? Like I've never seen this before. This is like Reddit. It's amazing. Um, yeah, get them, get them in there. I like seeing them pop up in real time. Um, so I'm, I'm happy to begin there wherever you want to. Let's just, let's, let's do it. Okay. Well, I actually see one in the Q and A that was also emailed to me. So why don't I start with that one? Sure. <laughs> this one is from Mary. Um, I've had an introduction to an art gallery by a friend who has exhibited at the gallery before. He spoke to the gallerist about me and followed up with an email. I wrote an email to the curator, but didn't hear back. I understand the gallerist may be very busy and I don't want to waste her time, but I'm not sure what I should be saying to someone who might consider showing my photographs. Can you give me help with that? Sure. Thanks, Mary. Great, great question. Uh, so if you have an introduction by somebody else, which is arguably the best way to get into somewhere because uh, having worked in many, many galleries, many popular galleries, to give you an example, we have like a few hundred entries or a few hundred uh, solicitations a month. So it's a lot to get to. Uh, and if our roster is full, that's not something we're looking for anyway. Um, but we will kind of go out of our way to look at the work and uh, give a proper answer. In general, I think all galleries should give a proper answer no matter what. But there's a little bit more of an incentive if you've been ushered in by somebody that that gallery is already representing. Um, so first thing is to say, hello, I'm so and so, uh, you know, my friend or my good colleague uh, is this person that you represent. They have um, they mentioned that your work may, my work might be a good fit for your gallery. This is why. And then attached are some of my uh, pieces along with my website and my CV. So that's what you would want to include. Um, it's incredibly normal for the gallerist or curator to not get back to you um, or to ghost you um, if, you've, if they've ever slid into your DMs and then slid right out. That's a very, very normal thing. Um, I think curators are the best ghosters. They're very good at ghosting. So that is very normal. Do not take it personally. Um, I do recommend following up, but only following up when you have something to say. So if you have new work, for example, that's a good reason to approach. If you have a show coming up, that's a good reason, a fair, something like that. But have a reason to follow up. And when you follow up, you include those images in there and continue from there. Great. Um, related to that, since um, Mary already had a connection kind of with the curator, so Patricia is asking tips on best way to get to galleries. So what if you have no connection to that particular gallery? For sure, which is a lot of galleries, right? There's, there's, that's the majority. First, it's important to begin building a list of galleries that are local to you that you can actually attend and put in some FaceTime with so that they actually get to know you, attend openings, have conversations with them, interact on their social, okay? And then from there, you can build out to places you cannot go. Okay, physically go all the time. So this is neighboring states, neighboring provinces, cities, and so forth, building that list and finding of those places, which of those are truly appropriate for you. So having a list and keeping that list open, but also being selective, being choosy. When you do have that, you begin your marketing campaign, which is that you begin approaching these galleries, just like we talked about with that kind of first letter of address, and then maybe following up with a takeaway card as well. Um, if they express interest, if they say no right away, you mark that as no, you put the date on in your Excel spreadsheet of which you're keeping track of all these things. And then in a year or two, you may follow up again. But, but basically that's, that's how you begin from where you are outwards, continuing to build that spreadsheet, continuing to mark it as uh, contacted or not and what the answer was. Great, thank you. Um, okay. one... I should say one more, sorry, one more yep. thing. There's also some shortcuts. I don't love calling them shortcuts, but there are some ways to get your eyes and your work in front of those eyes faster. Uh, art fairs are one way to do them. Art fairs that you can participate in. Um, 
and group shows are another, um, as well as shows in public galleries like the Richmond Art Gallery. It's a perfect example. Um, so know that curators of commercial galleries are also attending a number of public gallery shows as well as art fairs. Great, that connects to um, a question I got online or from an email mm -hmm. um, in your connection to, to group shows. Um, this is from Gretchen, who is a painter and printmaker. Um, she is represented by her local gallery in Dayton, Ohio, um, which is great, but she feels she's unable to reach beyond her local gallery. Um, she does detail like uh, what she does in terms of her regular 25 year long practice. So she's doing all the right things. She's working in the studio daily. She's keeping her artwork a priority. So she's a strong body of work. She schedules critiques with friends and colleagues. She visits galleries, museums regularly, meets other artists, writes reviews, keeps her um, CV and everything updated, applies for grants. So she's doing all the right things. <laughs> to me, it sounds like. Anyway, so but she doesn't make a living on her work. Um, in the past, that wasn't a priority for her, was to sell her work or to make saleable work. But she's at that point now where she wants to branch out. She does want to start selling her work. Um, she's considering first step would be to prepare a card with some images and have leave them at potential galleries and curators. Do you think that sounds like a good plan in order to branch out beyond her local gallery or any other tips you could offer? Yeah, so for Gretchen specifically, she would need to create the list first of possible galleries that she even is appropriate for. Um, and that takes time and research to figure out what that is. Um, and then to begin approaching those galleries by email first and through their submission policy first before following up with a takeaway card that she can mail into that gallery that is, let's say, a trifold that has examples of her work on it. But that would be one way. So she's doing all the right things in the studio end. She just needs to do all the right things on the marketing end. Yeah. And without reviewing, of course, Gretchen's social and all that stuff, we can't know for mm -hmm. sure. Um you know, how many newsletters are being sent out a month, how many posts are being made a day, how many stories are being done a day, all these sorts of things. Right. Great. Um, just one of our more popular questions from Nina. Uh, tips on finding and marketing to collectors who will purchase your work. So I guess different from the galleries. Yeah. So finding and marketing to collectors. First, we need to know what your collector, who your collectors are. And to figure that out, you need to figure out who your customer avatar is by first finding out who your customers have been so far and how they've found your work and heard of your work. Then you have to decide you know, whether or not you want to keep that same group of people or whether or not you'd like to change that group of people or grow that group of people. Um, and once you figure out that avatar, that specific demographic, that target audience, you speak their language. You talk to them in a way that sounds like you're speaking directly to them. Um, and that can be through something like Instagram or Facebook, or it can be through press, okay, uh, magazines, ads on certain radio stations or whatever it may be that is their main source of gathering information. So first we have to identify who your audience is and, and then we have to identify how they're getting their information. Sometimes we call that pain points. So we identify your audience's pain points, like what's preventing them from finding you? What's preventing them then from purchasing your work? Um, is it the price point? Is it um, accessibility? Is it um, not knowing whether or not the work will fit or how it will look in their space? Like identifying the pain points of your specific audience and then working to remedy those pain points. Um, and I think that a lot of the questions that we're going to get are going to be kind of similar in that way. So great qu question, Nina, but I think I am looking at a lot of questions on our Q&A so far. And I think that we need to, I want to answer that a lot of people's questions with the fact that identifying your audience first and figuring out who that avatar is, is crucial because there is no secret or big answer to, you know, this, this secret that if you do this, this will definitely happen. Um, mm -hmm. And I think maybe a lot of folks in my industry, um, and then just in, in, in professional development in general, tell you that there is, there isn't. Um, it is, it takes work to figure out who your avatar is, it takes a lot of work to figure out who your audience is, and, uh, and who you want your audience to be. So keep that in mind as well. Um, 
So without knowing that first, everything else is kind of a question mark as well. Great, thank you. Um, another question I hear this a lot too, uh, mm -hmm. from Tracy, my style varies. Tips to become more cohesive without feeling confined. And I've yeah. actually got that from a few artists that also emailed in. Perfect. Um, so big question. Uh, uh, building cohesion is a, is a big thing. A couple of, we have actually 12 different tips for that. I'm just going to rattle off a few quickly. One is to uh, create an inspiration board of other people's work, colors, textures, quotes, research bits and bobs that you like to create that inspiration board that's in front of you at any moment um, that you can kind of draw from. The next is to separate, separate out a series from the whole. So whether you're working in series to start breaking those up into groups, I call it building um, a closet. So if I have sweatpants and ball gowns and underwear and ball caps, I'm not going to put them all together in a drawer. I'm going to separate them out into their various drawers and put them there. So that's something you begin to do right off the bat so we can see it clearly. You can use your website to do this. It's a great place to do that. Um, and then when you, when we meet or when you meet with anybody, somebody else can sort of see, hey, you know, this one is getting a lot of attention. You're, you're really filling out this drawer. Um, maybe let's continue with that. Or are we done with that? Can we close it and begin working on another one? So separating out the work into series from the whole, important. Having an inspiration board, important. Also doing studies. Studies are important as well. So if a lot of your uh, scatteredness is due to lack of momentum, which is due to lack of time. Uh, we just did a very recent um, reel on this in our industry insights. Uh, that's That can't be changed. So momentum is associated with time. If you do not have the time to fail fast at this time, that's okay. Cut yourself in slack, take, take a break and just decide that's how it's going to be. Because every time you come to your work and if you're working on an epic piece that takes forever to finish, you're going to get bored of it. And when it's over, you're not going to continue to do another 12 more of those exact same kinds of pieces. You're going to want to move on. So that's what's going on right now. Uh, if you do have the time to fail fast, then you work on multiple pieces at a time. So rather than the one of one, you have three, four pieces going at any time. Um, that will help build cohesion. And then one more just for fun, uh, I recommend doing a, a jump week. So if you're interested in working on a certain genre or materials, and you really are interested in, let's say, using oil pastels this time, you use just that for a week, and then you switch the next week to the next thing and do just that. And again, the next week, a different thing. And you do that for basically two months, so uh, eight different times. And at the end of that time, you pick one of those things and you do that for two months straight. So if that makes sense, trying a whole bunch of different things, picking one thing, trying just that thing the next two months. And then you go back to the jump week again. Lots of other tips, but hopefully some good ones in there for you. Great, thank you. There, no yeah, there's a lot of tips. I also will say, uh, I've had a lot of artists that have worked with you in the past as part of our salon who have listed out those tips in great detail. So, and those videos are online. <laughs> So I will recommend looking back. I mean, I'm thinking in particular someone like Sandeep Johal, who I know has worked with you. And there's many other artists who are um, showing in detail those tips step-by-step -step online. So there are resources Fantastic. out there for you. Fantastic. Um, but in connection to the finding your style, um, someone, uh, Juliet, was asking as a new emerging artist, you know, also having a difficult time uh, defining her specific theme or concept, but she's uh, referencing particularly when this comes to group shows and open calls to group shows. So what advice would you give an artist who's never applied to an art exhibition before for a group show? Yeah, I'm not sure exactly what Juliet is meaning by that in terms of is her work, does she find that her work typically doesn't fit the themes of these group shows? That's what I'm guessing just from the way she worded it. Yeah. Yeah, I think I think you'd be surprised, Julia. I would recommend creating what we call a visual vocabulary. Uh, this is something that um, I often emphasize, which is that artists create a glossary of different patterns, images, figures, colors that repeat in their work over and over again, um, and to associate each one of those things with an actual meaning. So to assign meaning to the things that you're doing, each one of those elements. Um, so that when you create work again, the next time it's a little bit more thoughtful and you actually pick and choose what elements you want to include so that 
your visual vocabulary, so that you're using your visual vocabulary. Then when you apply to shows, you may find that actually uh, your work applies to quite a few different things. You also might be a little bit more choosy in the group show that you're applying to based on your visual vocabulary, because perhaps it's about the environment, it's about the role of women, it's about process, it's about mark making and materials, and it's about um, travel, perhaps, those kinds of things. So maybe we look for shows that are about things that are reflected in your visual vocabulary. Thank you. Um, Christine has asked, is there a resource list of Vancouver area galleries? And I will say, I know Melanie has is going to type up in the chat, um, Preview Magazine, which is a full list of BC and Washington state galleries. Um, and Alberta. Mm -hmm. And Alberta, that's right. I don't know if you have more resources. Yeah, so uh, it depends. Now there are commercial galleries and then there are public galleries, museums, and both the, the two rarely mix. Now in preview, there are both, but that really depends on whether or not the gallery pays to be in it. So there are plenty of galleries that do not sign up to be in preview, so they're not in there. Um, but we can sort of find, there is no list. The an short answer, no. Okay. <laughs> However, you could find quite a number of them if you look at A, either um, Fairs. So one, if you're looking for across Canada, I know you mentioned um, Vancouver specifically, but if you look at the Toronto International Art Fair, you look at which Canadian galleries have participated in that. You can also look at Carfac. Carfac has a great list of Carfac participating galleries. Um, that's a, a great list as well. Um, and I think that, and other than that, in preview, maybe Galleries West as well, the magazine, those are some great places to begin. I often recommend signing up for Instant Coffee. Um, and Akimbo, and I think Kathy has mentioned that as a resource for you guys as well. Yes, um, and that came up from a question that was emailed me last week from Nikki in Virginia, who, um, as a mid-Atlantic American artist, wondering what are the best ways to find Canadian calls for international entry. She's specifically looking for opportunities for group shows in Quebec and Ontario, um, and asked for specific spaces. Now, because she's looking for group shows and she feels she doesn't have the resources to stage an international solo show right now. I feel like this is three questions. First of all, it's about places to apply and how to find them. Secondly, it's how do you find a space that fits you and your work? And then her third question is kind of how, how to afford, how to take into consideration those shipping costs or costs to apply for these certain shows. Sure. Um, which is something I'm never truly fond of. Um, yeah. I did mention to her places to search more East Coast would be Akimbo, uh, the Akimbo website. Um, there are um, the ones you mentioned, Instant Coffee does both Vancouver and Toronto. So that's another good resource. Yeah. Um, uh, in the States, you have Hyperallergic Magazine, which is a great resource. You have Call for Entry Cafe, which is an, another fantastic resource for applicants. Then you have... Um, Artwork Archive, which is a platform which also does calls as well. Those are three great places to look. My recommendation would be definitely to sign up on the mailing list for any places that are of interest to you. That goes for everybody signing up on mailing lists for galleries that you're interested in so that you are first to know when there is a call. Um, just to quickly answer some of those other ones in terms of shipping costs, that that them's the breaks. Um, that's how much it will be. There are, pe there are little other tips and tricks depending on where you are for people that are maybe a little bit less that can drive the work. For example, if you are a painter, you can unstretch and roll the work. If that's the case, you really have to take into account leaving extra space on your canvas um, and showing that that is actually an option. Packing and shipping work, I recommend the Sachi website that has an incredibly comprehensive way to ship and pack work and duties and all that stuff. So I recommend popping on there uh, as well. You can apply for a grant. You can apply for a grant to do a lot of things that have to do with professional development and travel. Yeah. Yeah. That's Great. It. Really yeah, well. I know. That was a loaded question with lots of questions in it. No problem. <laughs> Kathy, do you oh. mind if I um, answer some of these questions that I see on the uh, on our Q&A that I know I can do very quickly? Sure. Okay. Great. Go so... Courtney asks, um, how important is having a large social media following? I'm specifically curious about Instagram. So Courtney, that kind of goes back to that other thing I was saying about, is your audience using Instagram? Because if they're not, then the answer is like not important at all. Like who cares if they're not 
using Instagram. If your audience is using Instagram, they find it. That's how they get their information. Um, that's how they typically purchase things through Instagram, through seeing an ad on Instagram. Then it is a little bit important. It's quite important. Um, your mailing list is something that you have control over more than you have control over the algorithms on Instagram. Um, I would work on building the, um, the mailing list. However, having said that with the Instagram, it is still something you have to maintain in some way. It helps to have a bit of a presence on there. So to be proactive and consistent in posting, um, I would still recommend doing, but you can have thousands upon thousands of followers and they do not, um, they do not equate into collectors necessarily. They're looky-loos and other people using Instagram. So it's not the whole world, but it's something that you do have to participate in a little bit. Um, yeah, I hope that helps. Camille asks, I'm wondering if you have any advice on pricing your work when you have di a diverse practice. Do you have formulas? Absolutely. There are a lot of formulas out there. We even have a document on our website um, as well that is for sale, um, but it is basically just your standard pricing per square inch. It's a size-based one. There's two ways to do it, pricing per linear inch and pricing per square inch. You can look both of these things up on, you can Google both those things and you'll find different formulas for them. If you have very different types of practice, uh, especially in terms of the medium that you're using, or the platform that you're using. So the format, um, it's canvas, it's on wood, it's on metal, copper, it's on paper. That is going to incur a different price list for each one. So you will be building, you would be building a different price list for each one. Of course, in that price list, it also takes into account your cost of materials. So if you are a sculptor, you're working in bronze. Uh, if you are a painter and you frame all the works, that's just part of it. If you are a photographer, you mount all the works, All all that, has to be done each time. Uh, so that also falls into your uh, pricing breakdown. It is not a pretty list and it's not an easy list. It is very elaborate with many, many columns, but once you get it done, it will feel good. It also takes a lot of the emotion out of pricing work because you can just look at the formula and match it up and find your answer right there. So um, have a different price list for each one of those things, but uh, make sure you have the price list. It also helps when you're raising your price as well. Each year, you can look back and see uh, how much it was and then you can raise it by a appropriate percentage. Okay. Um, any others that, Kathy, you want to highlight at this time? Yeah, there's two, um, at least two that I can see right now uh, that are asking about art fairs. Uh, so right. Jen is asking about um, whether they're a good venue and uh, Patricia, a also any art fairs you recommend in Vancouver or Pacific Northwest? Sure. Okay. Uh, so art fairs, you can only go to a, a certain art fairs, most art fairs, if you are with a gallery. So that gallery brings you, okay, as one of their artists, um, which is, if that happens, awesome. So if you're, for example, with a gallery or, or if a gallery has approached you and one of, you don't know whether or not you should be with them, but one of the things that they do is actually go to art fairs, that might be one of the clinching deals for you because that's quite an appealing thing, especially because galleries don't bring all of their artists. They usually bring one, two, three, maybe at the most, depending on how big their booth is. And it is outrageously expensive to participate in an art fair for a gallery. So all of it is very flattering and like a very awesome thing. Now, there are only a few art fairs that you can participate in as an individual. So as an artist without, without the uh, gallery or institution, um, I shouldn't say there are a few, but there are a lot less. Um, some of those include the Toronto Outdoor Art Fair in Nathan Phillips Square, um, the other art fair, which has a number of different locations also in, in the UK and also in Australia and super fine. Super fine is another one all throughout the United States as well. And then there are a number of others, just individual ones that are in certain places. Um, is it a good idea to do one? Well, that really depends on that year and that season. And we can't know that for sure. Um, some art fairs, like for example, the other art fair is upwards of 2,800, 3,000 USD for a starting booth, for example. Um, Superfine's a little bit less. 
So, oh, and there's also the artist project. I forgot to say the artist project in Toronto, also a great choice. Um, but every season is different. So there are some years, huge turnout, some years, not that great. It's really hard to say. And um, however, I do recommend giving it a go, giving it a try, but understand that it is a tremendous amount of work and energy and putting yourself out there um, and booth design and uh, sales and being in front of your work and talking about your work and selling your work. And if that's not something you're good at right now, it might be good to get some help with that. Uh, have another person with you, for example. Um, yeah, I think it's also it kind of throws you in the deep end very, very quickly if you're an emerging artist. And sometimes, sometimes that's a good thing. It kind of forces you to get all your ducks in a row quite quickly for something that's quite big, but it is a, a hefty investment. Um, question about Pacific Northwest. I mentioned those ones in the States. So Seattle, super fine is in. Uh, San Francisco is also super fine and the other art fair and uh, as well as in LA, the other art fair. And there's a number of different ones between. Um, in Vancouver, no, there is not one, unfortunately, not at this time. Uh, there are markets though, a number of different markets as well, like Harmony Arts Festival, of course, the culture crawl and different sorts of things are similar, but not, not uh, an art fair that I would recommend. Great, thank you. Um, there's one that I think is kind of um, a mix of a few, <laughs> or I'm sure. mixing a few people's questions into one, because um, Alusha is asking about, do I need a website or can Instagram suffice? And then Tia Marie is also asking about, you know, the best way to build an artist website if you have a platform that you recommend, um, or can I only use social media? Sure. Uh, kind of a little bit goes back to our earlier question about your audience and what they're, what are they using? Um, and if they're using primarily and only and solely Instagram, then you have, you can. However, I still always recommend a website. Uh, at the end of the day, it is the only gallery you can control. So control it. Um, you can control the order in which I see the work, which is important. You can control as opposed to Instagram, where you may post something that you're just working on. You may post a picture of some really great avocado toast that you just had this morning. You may also post pictures of other people's work, which sometimes I'm like, oh, is that yours? Oh, no, it's not. Uh, so the order the chronology of, of the website really helps. Um, as well, on the website, I'm also able to see an archive. So past work that you've done, which is incredibly important to um, curators and collectors just to see where you've come from as well. Um, you can control uh, a place where you gather information for the person who's viewing. So uh, gathering your mailing list, contact information, um, just a lot of different things that you're unable to access uh, with just the social media, even though the social media and the, the Instagram is kind of your daily um, journal, it is something that's like running all the time. The website is sort of more um, hanging out in the background for anybody that needs and wants to go there. Um, that sort of takes it a little bit further than the Instagram. It's always there. So it's kind of like a, a safety net. And, and I think that's pretty important. Just as a follow up. Um... Rebecca's asking, is it okay to then also mix diverse disciplines in the same social feed? So she's talking, say, for example, sculptural public art and painting. Really good question. Really hard to answer uh, without seeing the work. If those things all contribute to you, your identity as an artist, then absolutely. I do not recommend building three different Instagrams for those three different things. Um, but if something is just something that you're doing on the side and and you don't know, or it might not contribute to your overall uh, identity as an artist, then yeah, perhaps keep it off. You don't have to share everything, right? You do. Um, it's a showroom. It's on a, uh, an inventory, right? It's, um, so I still recommend finding interesting, creative ways to make the different disciplines look nice together. So if in, even if uh, you have um, like a color that's running throughout, and so this sculpture has a bit of red that moves on to then this drawing that has a bit of red that then moves on to this encaustic that has a bit of red. That is one through line aesthetically that doesn't make it look like a dog's breakfast and all over the place. Um, it also helps to have maybe something else in between that is negative space, nice white imagery to sort of break it up a little bit. Um, so there are creative ways to make um, a diverse practice look cohesive when it's made up in that grid form on Instagram. 
Um, another follow up just to the website option. Sure. Tim Marie was asking. Oh yes. Um, the best website platform That's that right. you would recommend. Um, sure. And I also want to add something from Katie who was asking about websites. Uh, do you think you should list prices on your website? Great question. Two banger questions. Love it. Okay. So uh, platforms, there are a number of different platforms. They're all, they all kind of do different things. The easiest ones like Wix and Weebly um, are extremely easy to use. So if you're building your own website, uh, it is almost foolproof. It's very easy. Now, uh, because they're easy, they have more limitations. So you can't customize as much as it is. Um, then we have ones that are really quite sales-based. So if you plan to do a lot of e-commerce, you might consider a Shopify website or uh, Squares Squarespace as well it has so many different um, platforms that are really catered towards e-commerce. And then we have ones that are a little bit more um, complex, a little bit more complicated. We have one um, called Photofolio. And then there's of course WordPress if you want to build your um, website from scratch and you have those skills. If you do not have those skills, I strongly recommend you do not use WordPress. Uh, because there's so many others that have much, much, much nicer looking templates um, that are way easier to use, frankly. Uh, all of these are different prices as well. Um, and if you look on our website, under website examples, you can see a very small collection of websites that we've built, as well as the uh, name of the platform that we've used underneath each one. We use three, Photofolio, Icompendium, and Squarespace. And you can kind of see how they're all different um, in little ways and which one suits you. Um, and then, sorry, I've forgotten the second question, Kathy, about uh, the website. Listing prices on the oh, website. Listing prices, yes, yes. Uh, great question. Really, really dependent on what your goals are. If your goals are to approach a gallery very, very soon, um, and the galleries that you're hoping to approach are second tier, third tier, so higher end, mid and higher end galleries, I don't recommend posting your prices. If you do not plan to approach a gallery very, very soon, and you plan to do self-selling for a little while, um, or you plan to do self-selling and perhaps approaching some emerging galleries, then yes, absolutely, I recommend um, listing your prices. There are also sneaky little in-between middle ways that you can do both, which is to have a password protected uh, page where then you can see access the catalog and the catalog has all the prices on them. Um, you can make it not password protected and still just to be downloadable, but it kind of separates it from everything else. And then you can see all the prices there. Uh, you can make folks sign up on your mailing list and only those people can see the prices. So there's lots of little kind of in between sneaky ways that you can add prices if you feel like if you feel like you aren't ready to list them yet completely on your website. But if the goal is to sell the work and that is your ultimate goal and you don't care whether or not it shows in a gallery first. Yeah, I recommend listing the prices. Like anything, when you walk into a store and if if that shoe that I pick up doesn't have a price on it, then I immediately know I cannot afford it. And I put it down and slow motion back out of the store. Um, however, maybe I could have afforded it the whole time. And they, you know, there was just mind games there. So uh, I, I never like losing a sale that way. So I recommend listing prices if you want to be, if you don't want to be coy about it and you just want to get the work out there. Great, great answer. And helpful for a few different of the questions I've seen come up. Um, another one related to website and what to include. Uh, Chrissy is asking about what are your thoughts on working outside of a formal series, even if you've previously worked in a series. So you have a cohesive body of work. Uh, but not a formal series name and a statement. So for the website, would you recommend an overall artist statement for all the work and displayed by year, for example, or should they each be sort of categorized by each series or grouping? Yeah, I, I always recommend still grouping by each individual series. And then perhaps right now, the series that you're working on that isn't super cohesive yet and still something new, I would put that under new work for the time being. Whereas right now it doesn't have a place to go in the drawers. Uh, you don't really know where it fits yet. It fits in a section called new work until we figure out where it goes, or whether we put a name to it um, or a series. So I hope that I'm just trying to find Chrissy's question again. Oh, but sorry. I, I, answered that. I had put okay. it under. No problem. I just want to see if I answered everything there. 
Chrissy is also works for Days and Confucius, and she's like the wind beneath my wings, everyone. So just I want to give her a shout out there. Um, yes. So, but then instead of overall artist statement for all the work then displayed on your site by year, for example. Oh, okay. Yeah. So uh, Chrissy is also asking, would it make sense to display by year? That's a lovely way of doing things. If you, all of your work doesn't actually, they're all the same, you know, they fall under the same statement. Um, you have one general statement and then you divvy by year. Lovely way to do it. Um, some people just actually have quite different um, concepts and meanings for each one of their bodies of work, hence why they list by series title and then individual series statements. So two ways of doing it. Great question. Um, other questions related to socials. Um, I'll show you if I can. So one from she, uh, how important is it for the artist to show his or her image or face on social networks? Is it acceptable for the artist to be more introspective about showing and appearing in videos or photos of themselves? Um, and someone else was asking that as well. Just, you know, how much do I have to show of myself on social media? Uh, yeah. So unfortunately, so how important is it? Like eight out of 10 important. So kind of important, unfortunately. As somebody who also really doesn't like to show themselves in, in social media, it's it's kind of important. There are sneaky ways to do it though. Um, it, I always say this more human, less robot. So every time you post, you're thinking more human, less robot. Um, could a robot have taken this picture? If you slip in a human arm in there or doing something like a hand, um, that is like, okay, that's a human. That's not a robot. So keep that in mind when you're taking it. There's sneaky ways of doing it. You can also hold the piece in front of you. That's a very, you've seen it. It's a very popular way of showing more human, less robot. Um, and then you can do a lot of the doing of the work, the making of the piece that doesn't show you either, but shows hands and working and mixing of whatever you're doing, paint. Um, so I recommend finding sneaky ways of, of kind of getting your, your body in there in some way. There also is another thing, more, more human or more living thing, less robot. You can also put dogs and cats in there, and that also helps with the algorithms, it also just helps to get a, have a more personal feel to it um, slightly. So you, dogs and cats, plants. Okay, plants can also be in there, but that's the tier of living, breathing things. Uh, so try to at least slip some of those in there at any time. If you have trouble taking pictures of your uh, self, then welcome to the club. That's a very normal thing to be weird about. Um, I recommend getting a photographer and doing a shoot and having at least 200 images come out of that shoot. I call it B-roll. So having a lot of B-roll come out of a set photo shoot um, that you can use, that somebody's just rattled off a ton of pictures of you doing your thing that you can use throughout the next year of your social. Um, so each time you're not like, God, I gotta set the timer, take a picture of my face. Um, so some sneaky ways around it, hopefully that helps. Great. Um, kind of connects to questions uh, that are very connected. Uh, one is by Jeff, uh, marketing aspect seems like a lot of work. How do you balance the time required in the studio versus marketing time? Are there outside sources that could help? Which connects to, and let me find his question, Joseph, who says, I need to get my art out. I'm not interested in marketing or chasing galleries. Should I find an agent to deal with that? Yes, um, definitely. Okay, a couple of things here. I'll answer Jeff's part first. Um, marketing seems like a lot of work. It is. Nobody said that, you know, when you became an artist that you also had to have a business degree or uh, an accounting certificate or have a PR agency. Like all these things are actually part of being an artist, but really technically no, you're supposed to just be making your artwork, right? Um, and who says you have to be an expert in all these other kinds of things. So you can outsource as much of those things as possible and then do the things that you can do. So for example, if we're talking about just social media, again, we're talking about Instagram, I recommend setting up a scheduler. So something like Later or um, Planoly or any of the ones, HubSpot does it as well. And you basically bank your imagery, you set up once a month, you or once every three months, 
you set up your social for the rest of those months um, and they go out on a certain day and you've written all of the captions ahead of time already. So that takes care of marketing, at least on that end. Um, ideally, you're still kind of on Instagram interacting, but if at the very least, that's something that you can do that takes care of social media marketing. Um, and then there are other ways. So uh, if you want somebody to take care of your newsletter, if you want somebody to do outreach to galleries, it's definitely something you can hire out for. So this is related to the other question. There are very, very few, if not none, like no PR companies that specifically focus on fine artists. And when I think fine artists, I mean visual artists. Uh, there's lots for musicians and uh, different kinds of creative agencies, but very few PR people that are specifically working with artists. Um, I have a few theories as to why that is, but I can't recommend a specific uh, PR firm that says we just help artists get into galleries, get shows, et cetera, sell their work. Um, what you're looking for then is usually a different person that has skills for one of those things that we just talked about approaching galleries, perhaps uh, writing copy for lots of different things, uh, running your social, et cetera. And there are people for those specific things. But uh, if you can find a Jill of all trades for those, excellent. And if somebody does know a specific PR firm that works specifically with entrepreneurial, solopreneur, uh, fine artists, please pop it in the chat. And mm -hmm. Melanie can put it with all the rest of the stuff for you guys later. I just don't know of one. Um, and I think there's good reasons for that, but, uh, yes, I just don't want to, hopefully that answers your question a little bit. Great. Yes. I think, yeah. Finding many different people is one way to definitely go about it, especially in, well, here might be different in other places, but in Vancouver, definitely. Um, Michael has a question that a few people have given the upvote, which uh, reminding everybody, if there's a question you see in the Q&A that is very similar to a question you wanna ask, please upvote it. So we know that um, that's one of the more popular questions. Uh, so Michael is asking, what is the best approach to getting into museums and international galleries as a mid-career artist? Because we've answered a lot of emerging. Yes. What about mid-career? Yeah, mid-career, and this is a little bit tougher because uh, they're international. So that's dif more difficult for you to do face-to-face um, -face communications. Um, however, one great way to go about this is to begin by uh, approaching them and submitting a proposal for a solo show. Okay, that is not something you're going to be able to find. That's not something you're going to be able to uh, see. Like, send in your solo show proposals here. Usually not. Um, you would have to get in touch with a senior curator or junior curator, email them your proposal to begin that conversation. Um, and that takes, it's a little trickier, but it is possible. And then you would email that, uh, sorry, mail them a print package. That print package would include your takeaway card, artist statements, CVs, and sort of anything else that you have planned uh, for the space that begins that conversation. Um, I also recommend perhaps signing up for uh, a few different portfolio reviews or crit groups that are not where you are. So international, so wherever you want, you're wanting to go. Um, as an example, New York Crit Club is in New York and a lot of their um, membership and their folks um, are there and they have great resources and perhaps linking yourself up with one of those artists and beginning that conversation and then building perhaps a, a dual show together or at least a collaboration. Um, that's one way of doing it. NIFA is also in New York as well. They offer portfolio reviews and doctor's hours, they call it. So uh, a professional comes and meets with you. And I mentioned portfolio reviews, depending on what your medium is, you may decide to participate in one in another country. Um, a lot of work. It does involve you physically going there with your portfolio. Some of them are online, but most of them are in person. Uh, but then it gets your work in front of maybe 10, 20 different professionals. So a bit of a, a bit of a shortcut there. Thank you. I hope that helps. Another one that is getting upvoted uh, by Patricia. Uh, what are your thoughts in using fugitive materials like watercolor as your major medium. I always feel inferior because I can't work larger scale and watercolor is very limiting. Yeah. 
So larger isn't always better, but I understand your frustrations, Patricia, especially with when it comes to value, because value things get, you know, an easy way to make something more valuable is to make it bigger. Uh, you can work larger with watercolor. Um, it just gets tricky because of paper and then freaking framing. Framing is the biggest um, I'm thinking of a non-swear word, just like a annoyance uh, to have when, especially when you work on works on paper, I recommend that you may consider trying mounting on panels, mounting watercolor paper, paper on panel. This requires a bit of, um, it requires practice using uh, a gel medium, or weighing it down and all these things. You can watch a video online and then at the end, coating it with a cold wax, perhaps as a, as a sealant and as a protectant. Uh, so you don't have to frame, but you can go larger with um, with watercolor. One of my favorite watercolor artists, uh, friend and client is Paul Morstad. And he is purely uh, watercolor on paper. The works are very valuable, very epic and beautiful as well. So don't, don't let the medium... Um, like I think, think about the, the good sides of the medium rather than thinking about the disadvantages. So for example, you're always able to ship your work easier uh, because it may be smaller and it's lighter, it's on paper, possibly can be rolled. Even if it's shipped flat, it's a lot lighter. Uh, so think about the benefits of the paper rather than the disadvantages of the paper. Storage is a huge part of it. And I wouldn't necessarily reinvent the wheel, like begin all over again in a new material just because um, you're wanting to make it bigger. Hope that helps. Thanks. We are starting to run the clock out. So I'm just going to remind everyone again, if you want to upvote questions, just click the little thumbs up on the Q&A so that we know what are the more pressing questions that we should get to. Um, I so feel that, like, uh, sorry, Kathy, I can answer a couple of these really quickly as well mm -hmm. that I've found in here. I feel like I've talked very, very fast. So I apologize to everybody, <laughs> but I really want to get as many of these done as possible. And I could talk about them all day, much, much longer, but um, okay. So Melanie asks, I've got a couple emails from international based galleries for submissions. The emails don't seem super personalized and tend to ask for fees to show with them. Are these real galleries? Are they ever worthwhile? What are your thoughts in general on galleries that ask for fees to show with them? Okay, quick answer. Are these galleries real? Yes, like they're physically real. There's a human being behind there uh, and not like a human being like like Nigerian prince, not like that. Uh, there's somebody there doing this thing there. Uh, are they worthwhile? Almost never, no. And should you do them? No, I think the answer is no. So a very quick answer there. Um, if they're not personalized and they're asking for fees, two big red flags. And uh, that's not to say that asking for fees is bad. It's not bad, but the, the lack of the personalization, uh, it's like very clearly copy and pasted. Um, that's a big no, no, throw that directly into the trash. Um, if you ever, if it does get personal, but still is asking for fees and you're like, okay, what's up with this? Maybe I strongly recommend popping on a zoom call. So a face-to-face -face zoom call and then gauging whether or not you feel that's worthwhile. The fee also depends. Um, it's, as I said, normal to pay a fee, not necessarily to show, but it's not fees are normal. Administrative fees are normal. Uh, you should be paying them. I'm okay with that. It just depends on how much and what it's for. So keep that in mind. Hope that helps. Can I also make a recommendation? Because this has yep. come up with a few artists. If, the, if it is a certain organization um, emailing you, um, I've seen artists just share it on their Facebook page asking other artists, hey, has this company, whatever, ever contacted you. And oftentimes you will get a response. Um, and the, especially if it's a scam. And I've seen that a lot, especially through Facebook. Um, so yeah, check with your friends first too. Great. Uh, and the community, the community mm -hmm. loves to, you know, weed out scammers. I love weeding out scammers too. I'm like a dog with a bone with a scammer. I mm -hmm. love it. So anytime, ask the community. Courtney asks, uh, what's the commission for showing, uh, for, sorry, at a, ga a gallery, what's the appropriate commission? Is it 40-60? No, it's 50-50. 50-50 is the standard. Uh, and then the exceptions are little other ones like 40-60, for example. Um, but 90% of the time it's 50-50. Hope that helps. Um, yeah. And uh, is there any 
so those were the two I thought maybe I could do. Okay, frame or unframe my paintings on canvas uh, that are on exhibition or submitted to exhibition calls. That's Millie is asking about framing. Um, depends, depends on your audience, depends on the work. Does it enhance the work and does it protect the work? Those are two really big questions to ask yourself. Um, framing does give it a very finished look uh, to canvas works. You might see quite a lot of uh, wood thin floating frames, like for example, these ones behind me, um, very, very popular and a, an investment. So a huge investment. So you have to decide what I recommend is doing one or two in your body of work so that you can photograph using them. You can also photograph them empty and then slide in all the rest of yours using Photoshop as though they are framed so that when somebody buys it and does want it framed, then you can go get it framed on demand. Um, but getting one done and using that one as an investment. So of course, the one that you get done is the most common size that you work in so that you can continue to use it on all the pieces when you photograph them. Hope that helps. Um, yeah, what else do we see here? Well, the most upvoted one right now is how do you pinpoint your audience from Christine uh, beyond the obvious paying attention to the type of person who buys your art. As an emerging artist, I have mostly sold pieces to family and friends. Yes. Okay. So one big, great way of pinpointing your audience is thinking about, uh, so with your emerging audience, you can do, I recommend thinking about like the kind of, forget about the, the fact that they're family and friends and think about who they are in the world. Like what job do they have? For example, what age group are they in? How much do they bring in each year? What kind of home do they live in? Uh, do they have a family? How many kids are in that family or are they married? whatever it is, where did they live and seeing if we can identify patterns. And from that, we can also now add on our, what we want from it. So our ideal, not just what exists, it's our ideal. So how do we want to change that? Do we want to find a different bracket of how much our audience is currently making? So we upgrade it a little bit. Do we want to change them a little bit from, let's say the professional market into the tech market? So we're appealing to a slightly different group. So first we have to establish the who we have by doing some deep research on where they're not just where they're coming from, but who they are. Right. And then from there, we need to add on those, like those tags about where we want them to go, like what kind of people we want. Then we need to find out where those people are looking at the moment. How do they buy work? And again, I'm sorry, I can't be more specific without seeing your work, seeing your specific style of work, but I hope that helps. Um, there's one that we have on a topic we haven't touched on yet um, from Nikki about if you have a view on NFT art. I get approached all the time to sell my art. Is it a scam? Will NFTs disappear? Um, as an environmentally aware artist, is this a bad route to go down? Okay. Is this which Nikki is this that's asking? Or... Uh, now it just disappeared off my. <laughs> uh, where did it go? Sorry, they're all scrolling That's in okay. quickly and <laughs> uh, <laughs> NFTs. So just to, uh, uh, talk about that. No, it's not. Um, it's not bogus if that's the question. However, it's not doing great at the moment. So if this is something that you haven't begun yet to creep into, I might not recommend it at this time. If there are other things that um, are presenting opportunities for you, um, just because they. they there was a definite rise uh, and then there was a significant drop. So um, perhaps not the time right now, but if it's something that you are interested in, it's, it has legs. It, there's uh, it's, it's not complete. It's not totally illegitimate. Okay. Um, but I would do a little bit more research into um, the world of digital reproductions in general first. Yes. Especially, I think, especially at this time, <laughs> things are, changing quickly. Um, question from Elena, looking for advice on how and where to find financing for big projects. Um, so I usually pay myself for materials, but what if I want to create a huge sculpture, which expenses include production, transport, storing, assembling, disassembling? Yes. Okay. So I don't know where Elena is. I'm sorry, I can't find this question, but I'm not sure where you are. But uh, if you're in Canada, then I would strongly suggest looking at Canada Council's um, from research to conception grant, that specific one. And 
Um, oh yeah, here we are. Here we are. Okay, research to conception or conception to realization. Sorry, conception to realization grant, um, and applying for that to begin. Another thing is to look at the huge sculpture. We're looking at placement, so we're also thinking about where it's going to go, and from where it's going to go, you can look at sculpture parks, yada yada, etc. Yes, but you can also look at uh, private companies. So if this is going to be in the lobby or outside of a, like a major building um, or business, you may approach them to ask them to sponsor you again so that you know there's a percentage. They can also write that off, by the way. So there is advantages for sure in contacting developers and seeing whether or not they want to sponsor that sculpture, or at least partially the materials of that sculpture. Thirdly, you can also contact, let's say, um, that municipality or BIA, so the Business Improvement Association. This is still based on location. So figuring out where you want it to go and then approaching that neighborhood to see if they have any funds that they can dedicate towards making that sculpture happen. Um, but first, I'd look at the grant and see if that's something that you can apply for. Um, there are lots and lots of different uh, public public artworks projects that do come up that you do bid for. Um, but usually a, like a company or an ag agency will bid for that and they usually get it. So it's a little bit harder to do as an individual, but not impossible. Hope that helps. Great. Um, again, I'm just looking at the most upvoted things. <laughs> and then they've just answered that one. Um, let me just see. Um, I'll maybe answer this one by Astrid first while we're looking, maybe. Mm -hmm. I'm starting over again on my art journey after a long pause. I'm nervous to start fresh from a blank slate, yet want to keep it as current as possible. Uh, thank you. So I'm not sure what your question is right now, Astrid, but maybe more like how to, like where to begin as a artist starting again after a long pause, it's always a scary place to be. Um, and it's its also a very common place to be. So don't feel alone in that. Um, I would recommend thinking about joining either a crit group or collective, perhaps just for accountability. You can create your own by contacting a few other artists that want to start one with you, maybe ones that are in the same boat um, and uh, beginning that to keep each other accountable and having prompts each week. So speaking of prompts, that would be more like joining a network. Um, there's a number of different networks out there as well. Um, Thrive Together Network is one that has some of our friends here today are in. Um, and there's loads of other ones as well. But they also help with prompts, accountability, and just your standard kind of resources for business stuff and uh, maybe shows that are coming up. Um, it helps to have a couple of group shows coming up that you apply for. So that even just gives you something to look forward to as something to apply to. Um, and it hopefully helps you build your work. So while you're kind of building those drawers I talked about earlier for your website, um, keep that in mind. Keep in mind that there's going to be at least three or four bodies of work that you're eventually going to have in your on your website. Hope that helps. Um, question from Nina. Is it worth approaching galleries if you are making fairly successful sales on your own? No. Yeah, I, I don't. I, I yeah. Uh, well, some people really, really need that clout in order to be like, I'm not an artist until I show at the gallery because somebody like whispered in my ear long, long time ago that you're not a real artist unless you show at the gallery uh, and that someone is maybe art school. Um, uh, but what is the purpose for you? So I often think about if it's having a solo show where you like to see all the work hanging together like this and uh, it means something to you that you don't do the admin which for a lot of people that is totally worth it for them not to do the admin I come from the gallery side right so I um I'm not I'm a, and now I'm on the other side uh the artist side so I know what happens on the gallery end and we work very very hard um so that let me just put it to you this way, at least with the certain galleries, the 50% is not as outrageous as you think it is. In fact, it is scraping the surface of how much the gallery needs to make each month. Um, now, 
you have to think if you have a body of work, that body of work is worth 45 grand, let's say in total, are you willing to give um, 22 and a half grand to another person to do X, Y, Z? And you can list out X, Y, Z. And if the answer is yes, then absolutely you should go for a gallery. That's like a, I think like a very real situation. So it kind of makes you think about those things very quickly. Um, just connected to the gallery question, uh, Sarah asked, what do you think about searching for galleries that specifically pay Carfax fees? Is there a benefit um, or more importantly, some tangent, tangential disadvantages to galleries not paying Carfax fees? Yeah, so to clarify as well, uh, Carfax galleries are not commercial galleries. So their, their main purpose is not to sell the work, but to show the work. Um, yes, it's beneficial to be part of a Carfax gallery because they pay Carfax fees and that's great to have. Um, also, if you are applying to certain grants, they, they, rec they need you, a requirement is to have shown at Carfax galleries before. So it's nice to have at least maybe two that you've done crossed off the list, even though they may be uh, somewhat in the middle of nowhere, a, a, like a smaller place. So uh, in terms of traffic, there wasn't a ton of people, but there are other, there are other benefits to to having shown there because they were a Carfax based gallery. Um, not many, there's not that many, uh, frankly. So uh, it's still the minority. Uh, so if you ever, if you're applying to commercial gallery, it's not gonna be Carfax just right off the bat. Um, and, uh, but if you aren't and you're going for public galleries, why not just start with the Carfax ones to begin? I think is a nice kind of, why not? Um. Connection to another gallery question, since we're on that tangent. Uh, Nell, I am an artist and also opened, co-founded a gallery which has become successful. Um, I do not show my, my own work. Um, how can I make sure that I'm still viewed as an artist and opportunities and not just view as a curator gallerist? Okay, is that in here? Uh, yeah, it's by Nell uh, at eight o'clock. Okay, oh, I see. oh, the time, that's helped. Okay, great. Uh, okay, this is tough one, Nell. Um, you have to not have those two things on the same website. So this is a situation where your business identity as a curator has to be separated from your identity as an artist. Um, and when you're applying for things like you could have your work experience, uh, but it's lower. It's the first thing on your CV is still going to be your education, your solo shows, et cetera. Um, and then lower down, you'll have your work experience, so on and so forth. Um, I assume you're meaning how can I still be viewed as an artist when it comes to applying to galleries uh, and to other collectors and curators. Um, but maintaining your own practice, this is a situation where I would separate these two things um, on social media, on websites, because that is something that will become blurred very, very quickly. Um, and not probably in a way where your practice takes a backseat and you don't want that. And I've seen it before. So hope, hopefully that helps. And from the get-go, you can begin to separate those two things. How are you feeling about time, Penny Lane? I feel great, but of course folks can leave and uh, <laughs> as, as needed. I feel like more people came in somehow, but- <laughs> Yeah, I, I think different but, people came in, yeah. <laughs> yeah, it's more, um, how are you feeling, Kathy? But that, like the sun has set, this is why I'm so pink right now. Um, <laughs> but I'm good, I'm good to keep going. Um, I'm fine, if you're fine, and... we can go for a few more. Again, I'll just remind people, just upvote the ones that you want us to get to. Uh, that kind of helps us pick uh, which ones because some have kind of been answered. Uh, I know a few people have asked where you are, Penny Lane. Can you? Oh, yes. This is Gallery Jones. <laughs> yeah, this is Gallery Jones. And this is Scott Sumi's exhibition is no longer on anymore. However, this is when it was on. And uh, I like to change up the background depending on what shows um, have happened, what shows that we've worked on, et cetera. Um, and Scott is a is a great client and artist. And friend, uh, we also did his website. So this is his show, Gallery Jones. Great. Um, and Angela has a great question. Uh, can you explain what it is like to work directly with you? Sure. Uh, we offer a couple different things. We have services. Oh yeah, I didn't. I didn't even talk about any of that stuff. Oh well. <laughs> uh, 
we have a number of different services like uh, website design and uh, writing and editing services. Um, now, and seminars, of course, seminars and workshops are a big part of our of our um, business. However, the thing that we do most are consultations one-on-one, -on -one, myself and David Ellingson. We both have specialties in different things. You can find uh, a more detailed um, explanation on what I do and what he does on the FAQ on our website, or you can always write in your question to info at daysandconfucius.com. And Chrissy will very kindly give you a great answer on, on what we do. We have half an hour and one hour sessions where we basically talk about whatever it is that you want to talk about. I know that we have a number of clients here today. So if clients have worked with me before and want to slip anything in the Q&A there about uh, what, we've, what we do and what we've done together, please, you're welcome to share. I would love that. Um, but it can be chatting about a body of work you're working on, how to make it better, how to make it stronger. It can be talking about things like this, which is uh, marketing materials, promotion, approaching galleries and figuring out where you're at, what you need to get done. It can be talking about your social media design and uh, newsletters, creating content, what's coming up next. Um, yeah. So basically meeting you wherever you are at that time, there's a intake pre-consult form that you fill out beforehand and that kind of organizes our time together. Um, and then folks, just like the dentist, like to check in uh, every few months, some, some, some people significantly more than that. Um, they like to see me once every couple of weeks, um, but we recommend a few times a year, but it's really up to you. We see folks in person and we see them via Zoom five days a week. And Kathy mentioned that in the fall, we will be starting a uh, office hours, which is very similar to this, where um, we have little slots where you could come in and ask a quick question. Um, if there's like, if you can't wait for a full session, because we do get uh, backlogged quite severely. So <laughs> uh, if, if you have a quick question, I can't wait. We have these office hours coming up in the fall. So keep an eye out for that. I recommend following us um, on our newsletter or on social media, Instagram, to get notifications about those dates. And I will add too, just I think watching some of the videos you have on your website are helpful because they do answer a lot of the questions that people have been asking today, just from some of the past talks that you've done. And right, so thanks. Yeah. Yes, thanks, Kathy. We have lots of um, podcasts and videos on our website, just various times that we've done these kinds of talks. And then we have these industry insights, which are short little reels, uh, about five or 10 minutes on our Instagram that uh, we take questions and we answer them. Sort of the most popular questions. Great. Um, I just want to say here that Melanie has written a great um, mm -hmm. little blurb here. She just exhibited at the Artist Project, which just ended uh, very recently, a few days ago. And she said it was a great experience overall. Um, a few experienced um, exhibitors gave her some advice um, on who to approach. And um, yeah, so I, I see here that she doesn't like to be pushy with sale, sales. Whoop, it just disappeared for me. Yeah, sorry, me new question. Came, <laughs> oh, coming back up. Okay. Yeah. Um, yeah, and other exhibitors were much more aggressive, it, it sounds like. Um, curious about my thoughts on whether it's important to be pushy with sales. It really depends, I think, Melanina, how what you consider pushy. I think it helps to have a good pitch. I always think a good pitch and knowing how to speak about your work is really the make or break between selling a work and not. Uh, so being a salesperson in, in some ways helps with that, but it's really also just about knowing and being excited about your work. And if you are those things, I think you're good to go. Um, there's a very used car salesman, e better call Saul aspect sometimes about uh, certain people's approaches, which I also find off-putting. Um, and it really it kind of turns me off of the work as well. As well. Um, but that's, I think that's a personal preference. I, I don't think that that's for everyone. Some people really love that. Great. Um, 
Another quick website question. Should you include your CV in bio? Asked by Dana. Yes. Uh, I think you mean Dana on your website, right? Yes. Yes. Uh, on the yes. Website. yes. Yeah, you should. If your CV isn't huge right now, you don't have to include it. You can just include your bio, but make sure that you are always updating your CV. Make sure you have a master copy and a working copy so that you can adapt the working copy and keep adding to the master copy. Um, but you can just have your bio if you don't have a huge CV at this moment. But you can, uh, once you do, you can put that back on. The bio is important. Your about section is important on your website. Um, okay, again, I'm looking at the most upvoted comments. So Jean has asked, could you share some tips for successful marketing on socials? I mean, you've touched on them a bit earlier, but are there any sort of quick tips for social? Sure. A quick tip for social is including in situ shots of the work. In situ doesn't have to mean that it's in situ in the client space, um, although great if that's one of the in-situ shots, but showing the work in a situation. So it can be on your table or hung up in the studio or on the easel, or maybe you bring it outside. Maybe it is in a home, but maybe not the artist, uh, sorry, the client's home. It could be in your own home. Um, we need to see more uh, objectness, I call it. So there's just, there are too many uh, it, artist accounts that are full crop images of the pieces. It's very difficult to tell what's going on there. We need to really see the tactility, which is a very hard thing to do in the digital realm on digital interface. So you're trying to emphasize at any moment the scale of the work and how it is in situ. So make sure that there's always something that references that around the piece. And you can get fun and creative with it as well. But we're trying to see the piece in situ as much as possible. Try to make that the majority of your images. And I'm just answering a question. Uh, <laughs> oh, Tracy Ann was asking, Penny Lane, are you based in Vancouver? And I'm just saying, yes, yes you are. <laughs> Penny Lane is based in Vancouver, but we do travel quite a lot for work. Uh, more and more now, now that things are opening up uh, quite a bit more. So yeah, it depends on where you are. We might see you in person. Um, I have a question from Nicole. Hi, Nicole. Um, tips on proposal writing for public galleries besides researching their programming. Um, it seems so scary as an emer emerging artist. Yes, it can seem scary. Um, so I think, Kathy, you could, you would be great in answering this question as well. But tips on proposal writing, a big one is logistics, I think, is a really great thing to say. I think sometimes when we, we're editing these proposals, they can get very out there and big. And we're like, okay, but actually, what are you going to show? And we need to sort of like bring it down to the brass tacks. Um, it helps integrate community as well. So how, like, why, who's this for and why should I care? Um, that helps too. And if you, if a gallery has included uh, a floor plan, which I think that 99% of public galleries have, try to utilize that blue, uh, the floor plan a little bit and tell me where things are actually going to happen. It shows that you've gone that extra step. Kathy, any, mm -hmm. any points to add there too? Yeah, for sure. And I mean, I really think it's important to consider the community that the gallery is in because all public galleries are really there for their community. So consider that and whether it has that relevance. Um, I would also suggest looking at past exhibitions and seeing how those were written up. And that will give you a few little things that maybe other artists have done and mentioned that you can always sort of take from and be inspired by to add to your own proposal. Um, not not that we don't do new things, but you know, I think knowing what has been successful in a space um, often means something similar will be successful again. Great, good point. Thanks, Kathy. That's good. That's great. And if you can actually physically go to the shows, that helps even more. Mm -hmm. um, just to clarify, really quick question, Susie asks. Hi, Susie. Um, are you saying that social media in situ shots are more uh, rather than professional shots? No. I'm saying make sure some of those professional shots are also in situ shots. And uh, yeah, they can be both either or they're not uh, mutually exclusive. Okay, um, any other sort of upvoted ones that uh, we can? I think, yeah, quick one. What about Etsy? <laughs> Is it worth yeah, it? Yeah, sure. Again, I'm sorry, I have to keep going back. I feel like it's a real cop-out answer, but it really depends on your audience. Is your audience on Etsy? And 
if yes, then yes. And if no, then no. Um, if you've made prints or something, there's a, there's a ceiling on Etsy, right? Of course, there's a, there's a price ceiling. So uh, keep that in mind. But if your work falls under that price ceiling, well, absolutely, that's a place to perhaps have your work. Right? So it really depends on what your, who your audience is and what your goals are with the work. Um, but it's a great platform. It requires a ton of work. You need to engage on Etsy for Etsy to engage back with you. Um, and then a question from Nikki about how would you approach licensing your work? Having the movie, movie industry use your work for exposure, are there other avenues to creatively market your work for additional exposure and revenue? Yeah, so licensing is a big question. Licensing, hi Nikki, is... Um, means a lot of different things, okay? So it can mean reproduction of prints. It could also mean your work on mugs and tote bags. It can also mean your work on wallpaper and having it as a as a print. And uh, so with the movie industry one, you might be talking about rental of work, which is a bit different than the licensing. Um, so it really depends on what it is you want to do, uh, how you want to license the work out there. You can also uh, get in touch with a company, for example, like Farm Boy, who works with original works and also licensing works. So there are a number of agencies that also represent artists solely for licensing um, to reproduce their works in hotels, for example, or for hospitality, hospitality in general. That's the reproduction of prints. So first deciding what form you want the licensing to be in. Do you want it just to remain an image or are you okay with it becoming an object? for example, and then from there deciding which venue to go to for that specific thing. Do you want it to be a high-end print or are you okay with it being reproduced thousands and thousands of times? It's up to you. So something to think about first before approaching um, how you want to license out the work. Uh, rental is a, is a very different thing. Rental is renting the original works, a little bit different. Uh, question from Marissa, because she asked if few times if we could answer her question <laughs> as time is Hi, picking away so sorry Marissa um so my question relates to resumes and what to include uh where should one include or list when they have an online exhibition I'm seeing more curated online exhibitions um assuming you listed under exhibitions or how important do you think online exhibitions are um yeah whether they get more eyes on your work or yep so great question Marissa like uh you list them under regular exhibitions. Uh, likely they're probably group shows for the online exhibition. So they, they would be under your group show exhibitions, just like anything else. Now, if you feel like they're starting to get to the point where there's like quite a lot of them, you will list them solo, followed by group, and then followed by juried exhibitions. So that could be an, a whole new section that you decide to open up, okay? Um, now, if you have even more exhibitions than that, we have solo followed by two person followed by then group and then juried exhibitions so you can decide to open it like divide divide it up that way however online exhibitions you put in your regular exhibition section hope that helps oh do i think that these online exhibitions are good is that, is that something that was asked yeah or if they're helpful yeah it depends on who is running that online exhibition how large their following is um, and if their following is the right kind of people um, so two points, how large the following is and if the following is the right people. If the answer is low and not the right people, then not very useful. But that is the case for an in-person exhibition as well. So very similar. If there is low traffic and not the right people, it's just as useful. <laughs> it's just as not useful, I should say. Um, but having online exhibitions, having the work out there in a way that didn't exist before COVID, like... I think is still a benefit. Um, I'm now really looking at the time. So I'm gonna sort of close off with this one last question. Um, we are getting a lot of nice comments about on all the great things that uh, Penny Lane does and, and um, what working with her has been like. So thank you everybody. Um, and now I just saw the question that I was gonna ask. <laughs> it went away. Um, oh yeah, what were, I don't know where did it go. There was the what were the three? What were the? There we go. What was the number one trait or top three traits that make an artist stand out? Asked by Tia Marie. Okay, top three traits that make an artist stand out. Wow, that's a really great question. I think it's also tough to answer. Again, um, depending on like stand out to whom. Again, that's sort of 
Mm -hmm. I'm always going to ask that question. However, for me, um, I will say that it really comes down to three things for me. If you like to watch your recent creative mornings talk uh, that I, I did, it's on our website and I kind of go into detail about this, but it would come down to um, tech, technical, so technique or practice. So how well you're utilizing the tool that you're utilizing. So your skill level, one, is always going to be there, practice or technique. Uh, the second one is intent. So your intention, why did you do this and has it come through? And then context. So the time that we're in, is it relevant to, does, why should I care? basically, like, why should we care? And does it matter in the end? So con context, intention, practice, those three things, I think, are how at least I view work and um, how I think we should all sort of think about viewing work. And, you know, maybe it's something that is not aesthetically pleasing to you, but think about those three things. And do they kind of hit on some of those three things for you? Um, and I, that's how I measure sort of success in a body of work. Uh, or the identity of an artist. Great. I think that's a really great way to end off because we have <laughs> a few more questions, but they all, I think they all connect to that question of what it is that stands out and what I others are so. looking for and all that. And I'm sorry to everyone that we couldn't get to all of your questions. There was so many, I but I think, like a hey, Elaine, you did awesome. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> We would be here all night. <laughs> I know, but I feel like I should have drank another espresso and just talked a little <laughs> bit faster, but um, I'm sorry. And and please, if you have these questions, I see there's some out there right now like that I would love to just answer right now, but please hop on our um, Instagram and write to us on our industry insights uh, as a either um, uh, as a comment, please. And then we'll try to answer it in our next video. That would be amazing. Wow, you're so generous, Penny Lane, and with your time and with your knowledge. Um, I know artists love hearing from you. I love having you as a guest. So I just want to say a great big thank you. Oh, my um, pleasure. Thank you. Thanks everybody for coming out. It's a great turn. I wish I could see all your lovely little faces <laughs> and the little pictures, but we'll have to we'll have to wait till another time for that. And, and perhaps we'll, we'll do an in-person one at some point again. Yes. So I think this is a great format. And thanks. Yes. Thanks again for all the artists that came out tonight. Really appreciate you supporting our programs. Um, I will let you know that soon this will be um, online. So you can watch it again. If there was anything you missed, we'll include some of the artists and the websites that Penny Lane mentioned tonight as well when we post it uh, with the video. Um, and I hope I can see you next month. We'll be talking all about artist grants next month. So, and that will also be online. So hope you can join us then. Thank you so much, Penny Lane. Thanks, Melanie, for helping me out. And we'll see you hopefully next month. Thanks Bye, everybody. everybody. Have a good night. <laughs>